things change when you're down in that valley oh don't lose faith for you're never alone for the God of the God in the night You talk of faith When you're up on that mountain But talk comes easy When life's at its best Now when it's down in the valley of trials and temptations that's when your faith is being put to the test for the god of the mountain is still gone in the valley when things go wrong He'll make them right And the God of the good times Is still God in the bad times And the God of the day Is still God in the Still gone in the valley when things go wrong. He'll make them right, and the God of the good times is still gone in the bad times, and the God of the day. God in the So it's my pleasure to invite Bill Hall. Where is Bill? Bill, come on up, Bill. <laughs> You're being obscured. Bill is a really important leader at Young Street Mission. Uh, he's actually the person to whom I directly answer. Uh, he's a friend, and can I pray for you as we, as we start? Please. Holy God, I thank you for your, your servant, Bill. Thank you, Lord, for his profound love for you and for our community. Thank you for the insights that you give him. Thank you for the heart that you give him uh, to love others. And uh, pray that you'd be with him. Grant him joy as he ministers your word right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Matthew. I don't know about the word answers to. <laughs> Thankfully, that's not how our, our view of how God is with us, right? We answer to God. I think Jesus came in the Gospels primarily to help remove that vision. But anyways, um, today I was given a couple of verses at the beginning of this week, or maybe, knowing Matthew, maybe earlier, I have no idea. But uh, so I didn't know where I was going to go. I was actually going to dive into James because I love the book of James. It's highly practical 
action stuff. It's great, and I'm all about doing that. But um, I also called it childlike spirituality, and I just couldn't get out of the child thing. So we're just going to look at that this morning. Although in your Bible study, I would tell you the end of chapter 3 of James is kind of describing what childlike spirituality is. And then the beginning of James chapter 4 in the scripture reading is really adult spirituality and what happens when we mature and get all inner into ourselves and stuff like that. So, so today we're going to look at childlike spirituality. And the scripture that was read, thank you, Paul, um, was Jesus took the little child whom he placed amongst them, which I really like. So a lot of us, we think of Jesus, he put him on his lap like Santa Claus, said, what do you want for Christmas? But he actually takes the child and sits them among uh, the disciples. What's up with that? Oh, I wasn't taught that when I was in church when I was young. Um, I was told children go to the children's room and adults go amongst the adults. So there's a pretty interesting object lesson right there. That wasn't even in my notes. This is going to be bad. I'm going to go long. What time are we at? I got to check. Oh boy, I've already added stuff to this and I didn't even plan on it. So this is, uh, okay, so, but he says, places them amongst them. And then taking the child in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Welcomes who? Who's me? Jesus. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me. Welcomes the one who sent me. So let's just take it up a notch. You're not just welcoming Jesus, who we know is God, which is kind of confusing. You're welcoming the one who sent Jesus, which is God. It's like, a, he's just like, I want to let you know what you're welcoming when you welcome a child. And what he's doing there is not just charity. He's not just trying to use a nice, pretty little object lesson. He's actually really serious. He's saying, when you welcome this child, you're actually welcoming God. Now, we in the world, in our, as, as we become adults in our spirituality, as we become mature, like to diminish these things and get gloss over them, rationalize, and I want to talk a little bit about all that rationalizing today. So totally uh, going in a total different direction than I was ever expecting, but you know, God likes to do these things once in a while. Well, I'm, I'm blaming God. I got to say, Bill wants to do these things right now. So hopefully God brings it together. So, um, so he says, you welcome the child, you welcome God. And uh, that should be an amen, by the way. Amen. Oh, yes, that's right. Um, and this is, when Jesus says, when you welcome the child, you welcome God, this, is, uh, this applies in terms of uh, justice and equity, because he's elevating the child. However, he's also talking about in our spiritual lives. We adults, um, as we mature, like to organize things so we can figure it all out, figure out all the pieces of our lives. It gets confusing. It gets muddled. It's like overwhelming. And so we like to organize our lives into sections and file things in the appropriate order so we can control our environment or at least understand our environment. We like to be organized. Um, we like to put them into different piles. And we call this maturing. Ad, you know, moving from childlikeness to adulthood. Um, we separate things into as many piles as we want. Uh, like uh, in spiritual terms, we like to do the same thing. We set, like to separate spirit from flesh. We uh, want to separate the holy from the secular or things of this earth. We want to say there's holy things up here. And there's things of the world down here. And we like to keep them separate. Um, we also like to say that we like to separate the church from this world. Um, but we should not be surprised when God likes to mess with our piles. He, let, he goes into that filing cabinet that we mature adults have organized to make sense of this world, and he reorders it. And uh, he likes to mess with our piles. He's not torturing us. He's trying to give us eyes to see with eyes of a child. And just so you know, if you welcome a child, and you see like a child, 
You're getting connected to the heartbeat of God. And that's what he's talking about in this piece here. Um, so God doesn't recognize our distinctions. We like to say God works this way and not that way. We like to put God in the box. But a lot of times God likes to shuffle things around. I'm not going to go into all the Bible stuff about how God does this. But he does it all the way through. The main one would be the one in Acts, when all, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit, how dare the Holy Spirit do this? But he manif- the whole, not he, the Holy Spirit manifests himself amongst the Gentiles. The rules say no, but the Spirit goes where he wants. And uh, me, being a Gentile, I'm pretty thankful about that. Um, so, uh, so anyways, I want to talk about this childlike vision, childlike sight, eyesight, this, the vision to be able to see like a child, to have childlike spirituality, how to en- understand and engage with God, uh, like a child. Um, and so, uh, anyways, so I had a memory this morning at church. I went to church this morning with my wife, which was lovely. It's a very rare occurrence where we're both sitting next to each other because she's, usually doing something and uh, during the service, usually taking care of the babies because she still loves the babies and she doesn't want to have any more babies, so she's just happy to help in the nursery. <laughs> uh, so I had a memory, though. Uh, this is, my child is now 18. This is Zoe, my middle child. And so Zoe was two and a half, and we were at church where I worked. I was very busy doing very important things at this church. And uh, no, joking about me. Um, and so somebody at the church said, oh, I'll watch to Shelby. My wife's name is Shelby. I'll watch over Zoe while you're busy mingling in the school, the church little party after church. That's like we like to eat after church, right? Everybody does. And so my wife got busy doing some things. And then she looked back at the person that was watching our two and a half year old, her husband, who was busy doing very important things. And, and, and Zoe was gone. So my wife looked all over the top floor of the church, then went down in the basement, couldn't find her, started having panic attacks as any parent would, but, you know, as the mom, even more. And I was very busy doing important things. Just like to highlight. (laughs) I'm joking about that part, but. So then she goes out into the parking lot, and then she sees this lady coming out of the bushes across the street. This is at Young and Shepherd area. A little Asian lady, Chinese lady, didn't speak a lick of English. And she has a hand, holding the hand of a little baby that she's taking out of the forest where there was a river and walks her across the street to our, to our church parking lot. My wife's like, oh my, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, blah, blah, blah. And she says, she says to the, uh, I can't remember what she said to the lady, um, she said, oh yeah, my wife said, this is the whole point of this. She said, you're an angel. And the lady didn't probably, probably thought she was a crazy mom because she probably looked hysterical. And the lady said only one word she knew, neighbor, 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 and then pointed down the street. My wife to this day still thinks she was an angel because we never saw them ever, that person ever again. Um, scripture does tell us that, you know, in the book of Hebrews, that we may be entertaining angels unaware. Um, the good thing about how God likes to mess with our piles is you get to decide. Was it an angel? Or was it just a nice neighbor? Or maybe was it both? Um, but God likes to mess with our piles and mess with our rationality. My rationality says, oh, it's just a neighbor, obviously. But maybe God's messing with my order of things. Uh, It's kind of like the story of the three bears, and then somebody, one of the bears says, somebody was sleeping in my bed. Somebody was messing with my piles. God is getting into my my things. And this is kind of childlike spirituality that I want to keep talking about. How are we doing with time? Oh, I'm, I'm okay. I've only got through the first paragraph, so I'm starting to uh, edit as we go through here. Um, 
Another story from my children, my parenting, early parenting life. I was walking my son home. He was five or six. I really have no idea, but he was very young. Uh, I have my, I have my memories, I can't really, you could tell me it was 30 years ago and I, my, my son wasn't even alive and I'd still believe you. So, um, and he's walking and I, obviously I was a pastor at the time and Liam's walking down the street with one of his friends because we were taking care of uh, our neighbor's kid at the time and his name was Dave and David's family is not a Christian family. And so Liam is talking about, you know, God, because he loved talking, he loved, when he was young, he loved talking about God. His eyes were wide open. He had, like, God vision everywhere. Like, he just saw God in everything. So he's like, nowadays he's in university, getting really smart, mature, so he's struggling a bit. But we trust that the Spirit's working in our son's life. So he's... Uh, he, Leon's pointing, look, God is in the clouds. And then, and then Davon, as a kid, only a child can do, caught onto it super quick. So Davon just went hyperactive mode. Just everything he saw as he was walking down the street, God is in the squirrel, God is in the... And he's there, they started laughing their heads off. And, uh, you know, you might just say, oh, kids are crazy. Well, maybe kids have better eyesight than us. Uh, in the Bible you'll see lots of encounters with God. There's a story of somebody coming in, in front of meeting God at an oak, a massive oak tree. But of course, you know, as we like to tell our stories, like big fish stories, it was a big oak. So it's a significant tree. So that's where God appeared. There's also ma major river stories where God, God and people encountered God at the river bank. There's also, of course, our favorite, the tops of mountains. That's where God always is. You go to the top of the mountain. That's where you're going to see the action. You'll also see God in a barren wilderness in the middle of the desert, obviously after not eating for 40 days. In the whirlwinds, there's God. Starry skies, burning bushes, lightning coming down from heaven is generally how we envision seeing God. That's where we see God. But when people want to know more about God, what does Jesus say? What is, how, do you, how do you see God according to Jesus when you're doubting? I'll give you a hint. He tells us to pay attention to the lilies of the field. What? It's just a lily. He says, look at the birds in the air. He says, look at the woman kneading bread. I don't know why I find this emotional, but it's emotional for me. He says, look at the, pe the workers <laughs> lining up for their day's wages. And then he says, in the act of welcoming a child. That's where you see God. Oh, just wait. I thought it was lightning and all this stuff, but Jesus calls us, brings spirituality into our everyday life, and he says it's in everything. When we look at the Bible, though, you may have been taught, and I was taught this, I'm a, <laughs> it's kind of funny, to, it's so funny to say the title of my education, it's kind of embarrassing, so please know I'm not saying this to inflate your view of me. Because it's really embarrassing when I can tell you that I have a degree called, <laughs> I can't say it, Masters of Theology. Huh? Pretty good, eh? It's like I'm a Marvel comic book hero with a Bible on my shirt. It's kind of embarrassing to say that you're a Master of Theology because I still haven't figured it all out. However, but maybe that's what makes me a real Master of Theology is that I know I don't have it figured out. The much educating as you could possibly get, and anyways. But many, many of us have been taught when we look at the Bible as it's a way to organize God into piles of order. He doesn't, God does not do this. God doesn't do that. God doesn't work this way. He doesn't work that way. 
putting in, we like to put God in a box. And we use the Bible and our incredible understanding of the scriptures to validate that box that we just put God in. I've already spoken about how God likes to play with our piles. The favorite verse of this group in the Bible, guess what that would be? God is a God of order. God doesn't do chaos. It's all orderly. And that's not actually the point of the scripture, if you read that scripture. Um, it's because people didn't have a voice in church. That's really what was happening there. And so uh, he was saying, make it a good order so everybody can speak. But we like to make it, oh no, God doesn't like chaos. He likes us to put it in our order, in our piles. Um, or I could say the purpose of the Bible for us in our discipleship, in our learning, is not so much to make sure we understand how it's all organized and orderly, but it's an instruction manual of how to live with your eyes wide open, how to see the world with childlike spirituality. I can say for me, it's always easy to miss these ever available encounters of God in my daily life. So I, I recognize that. And um, so at the end of this, uh, I have a list of principles. Hopefully I remember of how to keep the vision going. Now, but I'm going to keep going here. So now there's a thing called the Talmud, which is uh, sort of a teaching about the scriptures for the, in the Jewish faith called the Talmud. And one of the sayings that says this is, every blade of grass on the earth has an, listen to this image, isn't this a powerful image? Every blade of grass on the earth has its own angel bending over it, whispering, grow, grow. What? Man, that's a, like, that's a vision I could meditate on for about 10 years and still not fully grasp what that means and how incredible that would be. How does one learn to see like that, to hear God like this? If there is a switch to flip, I have never found that switch because we're all human. But here's a... So this is where I got the, the image for today. Uh, it's the ladder. Somehow, God likes to play with my mind. Remember, he likes to mess with our order. And so we're not doing James. So I wanted to look at the story of Jacob and the ladder. Do you remember the story of Jacob's ladder? It's in Genesis chapter 28. I'll read it for you. Jacob left Beersheba and set out to Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set, taking one of the stones there, a stone for a pillow. And the, and the message is that the stone turned into a feather pillow? No, no, that's not what happened. Just testing if you're paying attention. Um, took, take one of the stones, he put it under his head and lay there to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a ladder resting on earth and reaching all the way to the heavens, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on this ladder. This is his vision. Pretty cool, eh? There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. Notice this. Please recognize this verse because I want to talk about politics because it ticks me off. All people of the earth will be blessed by you and your offspring. Just so you know, Jesus came. Just want to remind you what that's talking about. I am with you and watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back, etc., etc. Then Jacob woke. This is the key thing I want you to notice. This is that childlike spiritual. He woke from the sleep and he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. God was here, and I was not aware of it. It's pretty cool. Then he said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So remember, he's in the middle of a field. He found a stone to sleep at. So there's no housing around there. 
He's in the middle of the field. And that, all of a sudden, is a gateway to heaven. He wasn't talking about top of mountains or Mount Sinai or whatever you want to say. He woke up from his sleep and thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. As with most of the visions of the divine, of God, they happen while we are busy doing something else. I did nothing to, in my life, I did nothing to make them happen. I played no apparent part in their emergence in my life. My only part was to decide how I will respond to that occurrence. Because since there is plenty of ways I can make that idea go away, I can re reject that story. So I'll give you some examples. I can figure, uh, th like, you know, the way I can, re I can say, oh, obviously that wasn't God. There's three examples of rationalization that we can use. I can figure that maybe I had too much caffeine last night. I shouldn't have had coffee after seven. Or and maybe it was maybe this one. I can remind myself that visions are imag are imaginative, opposite of uh, the opposite of death and taxes. Or the third one is I can return my attention to everything I need to get done today. These are a few of the things I can do to talk myself myself out of childlike spirituality. The other option is we can set an altar in the middle of our life where we say that surely God was in this place and I was not aware of it. You get to choose. It's just another rung on the ladder where God, where the angels are ascending and descending in my life. And Jesus is saying, as much as we want to talk about ladders to heaven uh, w with Jacob, Jesus is saying, you welcome these little children you welcome God. Something special about children, obviously, there's innocence, there's the teachability, there's the desire to learn, there's the desire to imitate. So how do we recognize God in our daily life? How do we recognize those attributes in our daily life? To live with our eyes wide open like a child. There's a verse I love in the book of Zechariah, and I'm sure it's probably most people's favorite verse in Zechariah, and it says this, despise not, obviously, I, I only remember uh, the old version of it, despise not the day of little things. Despise not the day of little things. In our society today, we know, we like big things, flashy things. The new, just so you know, there's a new iPhone 16, 18? I have no idea what number it is. We like the flashy things, but Zachariah says, despise not, that, and that's like a little primer of what Jesus came to bring into our lives in the Gospels. He wanted us to learn to see, like Jesus, to see with the vision of a child. And so here's some examples, and maybe some of you might have some in your own mind. Um, obviously, there's a little child. You're welcoming God. Does anybody know any others? Um, there's a mustard seed. If you a mustard seed is a, is, a, is a symbol of the kingdom of God. Anything else? If you're lower on earth, you're higher in the kingdom. Anything else? If you're... What? What are you? And what, what's the other side of that? Uh, that's right. First shall be last. Last is first. I really like getting to the front of the line for food. Every once in a while, you know, I try to go to the back of the line to act spiritual, but I'd, I'm not as spiritual as most of you who are patient. Um, in the book of James, it says, if you are poor, you're at a higher position. If you're rich, in the book of James, you're in a lower position. Anybody else? Any others coming to your mind? If you are weak, you are strong. That's right. If you're a child, it's good. It's good. You want to lead? If you want to be a leader, you must be 
a servant of all. Ugh, I really want to be like, you know, the leader. <laughs> and once, they, once Jesus backs it up with the servant of all, you're just like, oh my gosh, that sounds so exhausting. <laughs> Um, if you, uh, if you want to be rich in the kingdom of God, what? You have to give it all away. If you want to find life, you have to be willing to lose your life. This is the spirituality of the, uh, that Jesus brings of the vision. And then if you look at all the parables, each parable is, is a parable of, of the kingdom. Another example of this that came to mind, and we're probably coming to an end, is uh, spirit, oh, I call it spiritual geography. It came to my mind. I don't know. I'm not saying my way's right here, but I know that when I give directions to people and my wife gives directions to people, it's an entirely different experience. And the purpose of the story, I'm just saying ahead of time, for the purpose of this message, my wife's way is way better. Because when I like to give directions, I see the map. I see like Google Maps. I know what's north, south, east, west. So I say, go up here, to go west, then go north and east. And nobody really understands what the heck I'm talking about. Not everybody sees the world like a GPS map. When my wife gives directions, she says, go down that street about three blocks. You'll see a beautiful flower in a window. And then you're going to turn right on that street. You're going to go down two and a half blocks. You'll see a park with a swing set and a beautiful like slide. And then there you're going to turn left. My wife's directions are vision oriented. They're paying attention. She, she actually knows the things that she's describing. Whereas mine, it's the exact opposite. Um, and so I think my understanding is actually not the healthy way in, in terms of spiritual geography. We need to walk with our eyes open, paying attention. So I have a couple of stories. When am I supposed to be finished now? Three? Okay, three. Okay, I'll tell, I'll tell uh, let's see. What is the other story? Okay. Um, so two stories. Two quick stories. One was I was talking to a guy in Allen Gardens. His name was John. He was living in a tent, and I'd like to pass by him once in a while and bring him some food and whatever it is, just to have a chat and see how he was doing. And I always noticed that he had one of the tents where he was off to him, his own. So I went to talk to him. The first time I talked to John, sat outside his thing, he randomly, like he's also not necessarily well fully, uh, mentally, but then he, he paused and he says to me, remember we're talking about, we get to choose how we, who we're hearing from. So he says to me, he says, hey, you have the Father's heart. And I was like, well, that, well, this man is not in his right mind. So obviously, we rationalize. Or did I need some encouragement? And God wanted to give me encouragement through John. Another story, which is totally exact opposite of what I'm trying to tell you, <laughs> but it's actually not bad. Uh, I think it was last night. I was uh, at, at local Tim Hortons near my house, a lot of homeless where I live. And so I saw this man out, um, sitting outside the Tim Hortons, and he was looking very agitated and angry. And so I went up to him very politely, like from a distance, because I knew he was in his own space, in his own, in his own realm. And I said, can I give you any money? Is it okay? Can I give you some money? And so I gave him, uh, like, I gave him some money. Now, you might think, he just went, oh, you're the most generous person on earth. Thank you so much, sir, kind sir. No, he got angry, agitated, and then he said, and he put it in his pocket, and he looked, I comes like, I stayed a little bit at a safe distance, and then he just said, it's all, BS. I won't say the word he said with an angry voice. So, I can dismiss both of these stories. You can dismiss even the BS story as just being a random act of a guy who's out of his mind. Or, I could choose to hear from God in these stories. Despise not the day of little things. I can hear David saying, God is in the squirrel. 
And then I hear uh, John at Allen Garden say, I have the Father's heart. And then I hear this man at the Tim Hortons say, it's all BS. And I, th and I think about it for a second, and I, I think, yes, it is. At a food bank today, one in every 10 persons in Toronto uses the food bank weekly. One in every 10. It's a lot of people. You see mortgage rates going skyrocketing for people that own property and are privileged to do so. But at the same time, the cost of that is rent has risen astronomically to cover these costs. And then I see this Tim Hortons man sitting, on the ro uh, sitting next to the door, and I say, oh, he's right. Maybe God wants to speak to me through that person. Another friend came to me. Oh, I always have stories. I've got to stop. Um, last, last story, I promise, Matthew. Sorry. But it's a story, so it's always better when it's a story. Uh, a friend came to church this morning to the church I attend up in the North End at Young and Finch area. And he's a friend who has a church that he goes to regularly on Sunday, except when the addictions happen and he feels unworthy to attend his church because it's a pretty popular church and everybody dresses up nice and stuff like that. Sorry, dresses up in suits and dresses and stuff. Um, sorry, I didn't dress in my suit today. Sorry about that. And, but anyways, I only see him, though, when the addictions kick in, and he no longer feels worthy of normal church. So then he comes and sees me. Um, so I think of this guy, the Tim Hortons, I'm like, okay. So I'm going to end with um, how to, uh, f five sort of how-tos um, in regards to uh, being childlike, how to be childlike. First one is you want to look for God in normal life. Just look for God in the normal. Second principle is the physical is holy. Three, it, number three is practice paying attention. Practice paying attention. No, I'm not going there. And then the fourth one is embrace imperfection. And the last one is embody compassion. Okay. Lord God, thank you for today. I thank you um, for um, how you have come to save each and every one of us, um, not only eternally, but in this life, to help us make sense of this world. And I thank you that you've given us your son to give us a, a way to live um, and an understanding of how we are to be in this world. Um, I pray blessings on the rest of the servers. I pray blessings on this community of faith and that you would bless them in the coming week. Amen. Thank you, Bill. That awesome sermon. However, God uh, calls us to listen. Mm. It's uh, to be obedient to his word. Uh, sometimes we don't always understand what he's calling us to say or to hear um, but again if we quiet ourselves and quiet our spirits we will always hear what God wants us to hear and see so thank you for that